When I heard the theme was cancel culture for uh, what was supposed to be family vacation, I was super excited. And then when we decided to move some stuff around, I really, really hoped that we would do it for another retreat because cancel culture um, is just something that hits at my heart. Because when I look at my life and look at the things that I've done, I should have been canceled a long time ago. The way that I treated women, the drinking, and the way I live my life, the jokes I made, I would not have survived in today's world. I'm thankful that there was no Twitter back when I was in the world. And the lack of grace and mercy within our society, it kills me. Because I've been forgiven of so, so much. And I know a lot of your stories, and I know you've been forgiven of so, so much. So when Carrie talked about canceling culture, that really hit with me last night, and I hope it hits with all of you. Because what's going on in the world right now is not the way that Jesus Christ would like us to live. It's not the way that Jesus Christ came down from heaven to earth to live to set an example for us of what it meant to cancel a debt and to give us an opportunity at a new life. And so as we talk about canceling the culture, I do pray that it hits right at your heart. And so I want to start with a question today is, what do you love? What are the things in your life that you love? You know, if you look on uh, Facebook or Instagram or any of those right now, you see those Fast and the Furious memes about family. And many of you would say, man, I love my family, and that's a good thing. I love my family. I love my wife, my kids, uh, my church family, and, and everyone. A lot of you would say just your friends, your job, your school, maybe a certain sports team. Go Cardinals, right? Right? We're in St. Louis. This is Cardinals Nation. We love our Cardinals, right? And then we have the church answer, right? I love God. If you were asked my three-year-old, then when we're doing our devos, every answer is Jesus, right? Every kid, every answer is Jesus, right? And so you could say, man, I love God. But that last one, I think there's a lot of us that need to really think about that and really think about, man, do we love God the way that we say we love God like my three-year-old Penny, who if you've seen her, curly red hair, and she's hilarious. But do we love God like that? That is the most correct answer, especially at the CME workshop. But our verse that we're going out of at a 1 John 2, do not love the world or anything in the world. Our love for God must be number one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Put God at that number one spot. If anyone loves the world, so if you love anything more than God or put it before God, the love of the Father is not in them. That's kind of scary, don't you think? That's really scary. And that's why I ask you to think about that question. What do you really love? For everything of, in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So how does that love of the world show up? In the lust of the flesh. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then tonight, Charles Shedd is going to talk about the lust of the eyes. And we're going to talk about the pride of life. So what is it to love God? Loving God is to glorify God. And to glorify God, we must obey God. We gotta say that God is greater than culture. God is greater than the things that the masses say. There is a big, big push for just loving and accepting and, and everything is okay and you do you. But does God really say that? Like I said, ultimately loving God means obeying God in 1 John 5, 3. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. To love God means obeying God. So when you love the world, when you obey the world, and when you give in, there's a huge problem with that because the Bible says that when we obey two masters, God's not our master. So what does loving the world look like? Loving the world means giving in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And like I said, this lesson, we're going to look at the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is our carnal desires. 
It's the things that God has wired us to desire. And some of those are good things. In fact, a lot of those are really, really good things. But what happens is, is Satan gets in and he twists them and he tweaks them and he gets in your ear and he takes a good thing and he makes it a bad thing because he says, you know what, you can get this outside of God. You don't need God for this. You can be in control. So it's things like our sexual purity, right? Our sex drive, a great thing. God designed sex to be great, but he also put boundaries on that. Our safety, our protection, right? That's a carnal desire. We have this need to want to be safe. Our sustenance and provision. We need to survive. The things we eat, the things that we put into our body, those are things that we're wired to desire. And this social interaction. And that's not on a human list of all, like human lists of needs and things that you need, but God has wired us for interaction in relationship. And that goes sideways so easily because instead of pleasing God, we look to please people. And that can be a problem. The lust of the flesh says that my cravings are more important than what God wants. So when we look at that thing, that sex, the relationship, the things that we put into our body, we say, you know what, this temporary is so much more important than what God wants for us. It tricks us into justifying our actions. And as Americans and around the world, to be honest, we're bombarded with these things. From the music we listen to, the television shows, social media, which is a guy teaching a class on social media tomorrow. You might want to go check it out. Politics and a world ideology. Cancel culture. We will allow almost anything into our minds. And we not only, we don't stand against it, we invite it in. There's all these things in our lives and we're, we're doing this stuff and we say, come on in. This is comfortable. Come on in. This is what we desire. We don't stand against it. We're inviting it into our lives. And we allow it so close that like when Icarus flew with his wax wings close to the sun, he melted and he fell. We invite this stuff in and we're surprised that it, that, that it bites us. We cannot live like that. I, it used to be that to get pornography, you had to go to a bookstore to get it. I'm showing my age here. That was like when I was a kid. Now you got it literally at your fingertips and the music you listen to and everything like that and our desires and we're bombarded and we compromise and then we allow that stuff in our lives. Our gaming systems, our phones, the anime, the TV shows, all this stuff and we wonder why the church isn't being effective like it was in the first century. We're allowing culture to set our direction and not Jesus Christ. And that has got to change. Because of the flesh, we compromise and we feed our flesh. You see the breakdown in society. Over the past 30 years, we've seen the desires of the flesh become not only accepted, but it's pushed. Boom, canceled. Sex before marriage, cohabitation. There's a carnal desire. You know that there's over 110 million Americans that carry a venereal disease. That's like one in three Americans. That's crazy. That's more people that struggle with alcoholism. Another carnal desire. 21 million people. Isn't that crazy? And do you know there's a legitimate push to normalize pedophilia? I say legitimate, but there's like a strong push for that. That's weird. And when we let carnal desires take over and the flesh take over our society, that's what we get. But it's also the culture of the church in some ways. There's such a push in progressive Christianity to just accept and this stuff and let's cave and let's, if we can kind of be like them, if we can kind of be like them, we can influence them. You see Jesus do that when he was flipping tables over and making whips? He wasn't doing that. He came to stand and to set an example for us. But yet when we look at that example, we don't follow it. In Colossians 3, 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, your flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. It's kill or be killed. You remember in 1 John when it says the world and its desires pass away? Kill them or be killed. Because at the end of this world, if you give 
into your desires and you live by that, you are not with Jesus. You cannot live like that and have a legitimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And for far too long, we've let the culture set the tone in our churches and we are becoming ineffective. And churches every single day are closing their doors. People are walking away from the one thing, not canceling culture, not the thing that people think that are gonna be the solution. They're walking away from the solution because of what we've allowed and what we've compromised in our church and our convictions. So how do we put to death our flesh? The answer is not assimilation. I talked about that. Well, if we can kind of blend in, we can kind of do this and we can kind of fit in, we can make all these friends, we don't really stand for anything. That's not the answer. But the other thing that we do as churches is we don't assimilate, we just avoid. There's an avoidance where we just, if we stay away, we can be safe and we set up our homeschools and we do all this stuff. And we're not in the world. We're completely separated from it. And that is not a way to combat the flesh either. Because what happens is, is we protect our kids and we do this stuff. And then when we send them out, I went, my first college was Missouri Baptist University. There were a lot of great people there. But what happened was, is the kids that were avoiding culture and not knowing how to live in it were the wildest ones that went there. I ain't telling you, I was among the wildest ones that went there. They were right there with me. Because when they got out, they weren't equipped to handle the world and they weren't equipped to handle the lust of the flesh. We have to equip our people. And an assimilation is not it. An avoidance is not it. As a church, we must alter our approach. We have got to do things differently. I see it all the time. When we do the same thing over and over again, Ben, what is it? Insanity. It is insanity. I am telling you. The, a changing of the approach, when the Bible says cut off your right hand, that's changing your approach. It means you're willing to do whatever it takes to get those desires and deal with that stuff. Gouge out your eye, cut off your hand, be radical in the way that you approach your life because it's not working for many of us. It is not working. The last year has been full of excuses. Well, guess what? COVID is over. It is time to ditch the excuses and deal with our lives and get back out in the world like Jesus Christ came to live and die for us to do. So we have to alter our approach. So if I'm gonna alter my approach, the first thing I must do is I must make a commitment to God's standard. And you're gonna hear this all weekend. You heard it last night, you're gonna hear it here. Why do we keep saying it as a, the Crossing Church? Why is that one of like the points in almost every lesson? Because we still need to hear it. I talk with people all the time and I say, well, what does God's word say about this? And because you're in a situation or because your desires or because your flesh is wanting something, it doesn't matter. There's the exception clause for you. There is no exception clause. God's standard has got to be our standard. In Proverbs 119.9, how can anyone keep his way pure? By living according to your word. You've got to make God's standard your authority. What are you going to base your life on? Are you going to base it on the commitment you made to God's word or by your standard of living? Like I said, my standard led me to drinking, led me to mistreating women, led me to all this stuff before I was a Christian. And I can tell you, the times in my life, in the last 16 years that I've been a Christian, that I've compromised to my own standard, it's the times where Marie and I got in the biggest fights because I was compromising and I wasn't leading. I was giving in to my, my, my flesh and the desires. The times I wasn't making God my standard in my ministry is the time where you all suffered because I wasn't living by God's standard. And I can tell you from the people that I've talked to and counseled and things like that, when you don't make God's standard your standard, you're hurting yourself, you're hurting the ones that you say that you love, you're hurting your church, you're hurting the kingdom, and you're hurting the society around you because the world so desperately needs people that are gonna stand up and say, God's standard is my standard regardless of what's going on in my life. So ask yourself, am I more committed to what I believe God says will meet my needs or am I more committed to think what I think will meet my own needs? Did you know, no matter, like, does anyone consider themselves an expert in something? Anyone? Drew, you're an expert in disc golf-ish, right? 
Did you know that as good as you are at disc golf, that God knows more about disc golf than you? That's true, right? And no matter what you think you're an expert in, God knows more. He simply does. God says several things in this world aren't very popular. He knows more about the world than you do. So when it comes to your sustenance, what you eat or drink, God knows more than you. So when you want to have that drink or you want to unwind, I know a lot of people in here, they smuggle, so they smuggle, <laughs> they struggle with smoking weed. A lot of people. Man, it's been a really long day. Wouldn't you like to light up and kind of forget about it? God says, no, I know more. Or maybe you want to go online and check something out because it's the way you relieve stress. God says, no, I know more. When it comes to your safety or guarding your heart, God says, hey, I know more. You got to trust. You got to have faith. In your relationships, God says, I know more. Whether it be who you date, who you marry, your best friends, the people at work, God knows more. And he says, there's a certain way that I've set up for you to do these things. And God says, I, you have to commit to my standard in all areas. So I have to decide, when I don't understand, when I don't like it and it's not popular, what are you going to do? He said, there's, I know a lot of your, your stories. I know a lot of you have been abused and mistreated by someone. And my heart breaks for that. God's heart breaks for that. But just because you've been hurt doesn't mean you have a past to do whatever you want. There's no exception in that. When Marie and I had a miscarriage, I wanted to go out and drink and get drunk and kind of just forget about it. But God said, you know what? My way is better. I didn't understand it, but I had to live by it. When my sister was passing away five years ago, man, my parents, my family was being difficult. And I so wanted to rip, off, rip into them and just rip, verbally rip their heads off. But I didn't. Because God says, my standard is your standard, and you need to live by it. So no matter what you go through, no matter what happens in your life or what has happened in your life, there is no excuse to compromise God's standard. And the culture says, hey, if it feels good, if it feels right, do it. No, there's no exception for that. And you may not understand it, you may not like it, but guess what? It takes courage in this world to do that. Because I had to talk with my... Um, with my uh, 10-year-old daughter. We were at Cedar Point. And we were walking around, and um, crop tops are the thing, right? And short shorts are the thing. And I looked at my daughter, I pulled her aside, and I'm like, hey, like those, I'm, I don't know those girls, but I don't want them to, you to make that your standard. And she goes, I know, Dad. I said, but here's the thing, Audrey, is you're going to have a lot of people say, and your friends say, oh, it's cool, it's more comfortable, it's this, it's the fashion, it's whatever. And God says, you don't need to do all that. So what is it in your life that the culture is saying to you, hey, it's cool, it's, it's comfortable, it's good for you to do? It may not be a crop top, it may, be, it may be pornography, it may be cussing, it may be a bad attitude, it may be pornography, it may be drinking. You know, I have people in my life that, that have literally said to me, I don't trust a man who drinks or who doesn't drink. Isn't that kind of weird? Yeah. Because in my life, drinking gave me no, nothing good. I saw my dad beat up on my mom. I was drinking and driving and the things that I did. And I said, you don't trust a man who doesn't drink? Okay. But that's what the world says. That's what the culture says. Give into your flesh. It's all good. We have to make God's standard our standard. Number two. Number two. I must manage my mind. Every desire and temptation, that carnal desire, like I said, you're wired to desire. And it starts in the mind. Proverbs 4.23, be careful what you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. And Proverbs 23.19, keep up your mind on what is right. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that the flesh is not right. The battle of the flesh is lost or won in your mind. When you open your mind, it tends to get filled with garbage. Anytime you see someone really messing up in their life, it doesn't start with the action, right? If you see someone go off the deep end and they're drinking, they cheat on their wife, whatever it is, it does not start with the action. It started with the thoughts. There were chinks in the armor long before what happened. 
They were preoccupied with the thoughts of the flesh. And long before they reaped the fruits of the flesh, you know, in Galatians 5, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. The, the fruits of the flesh. And the Bible very clearly says it, and, the bi- and then science backs it up, that those things start in our mind long before you, you see them out in your life. It's not like an affair. You come home and, and you, you tell your wife and say, hey, I, I slipped up and had an affair today. It just happened. No, that affair started long before because the devil plants seeds months, days, years sometimes before. And he messes with your desires and he's there on your flesh and he's really just poking and prodding and putting things in your life. And if you don't deal with your mind and you don't deal with the things in it, you're going to give into your flesh and you're going to bow to culture. And we can't do that. So here's how more immorality happens. Thoughts lead to emotions and emotions lead to action. So in your mind, the first thing you do is you, you accept the sinful thoughts. First, it starts with accepting those things in your mind. Man, the, the, the affair example. Man, would, uh, I wonder what it would be like to be with that person. Man, she's pretty. Man, she makes me laugh. And sometimes the affairs aren't even the physical thing. It's, man, she, she's easy to talk to. I wish my wife was as easy to talk to as her. And then you begin to fantasize. Did God really say Man, God put this person in my life. Maybe I'm supposed to be with this person. Does that sound like anything that you would read in the Bible? You start having doubts. And maybe you start fantasizing, and it grows. Maybe it's a girl in your class, a girl that you're dating. Maybe a girl in the ministry or a church. What would it be like? You think it's harmless. No one's, I'm not acting on it. No one even knows about it. It's a victimless crime. It's not. You see things like famous evangelists after their death have funds set up for his mistresses. That's crazy to me. But like an IT's spoken word, guys, it's just not you. Girls, you're not off the hook on this. You do it too. I know I like to pick on the guys because I am a guy, but girls, you do it too. So you accept the thoughts, and then you move in this emotional thing. I kind of like this person. I kind of like this, and your desires and your flesh are really going. And you start making gestures and comments. You flirt. You do things like that. You flirt with the world, and you're making yourself available. In Proverbs 7, 7 through 10, at the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple... I notice among the young men, a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight. As the day was fading, as the dark of night was set in, then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute with crafty intent. We put ourselves right in that situation, whether it be on your phone, whether it be in class, whether it be at the store, wherever it is, we put ourselves in bad situations. And then next comes, the woman comes out dressed like a prostitute with a crafty intent. And the next thing, there's a physical involvement. You act on it. Whether you physically act on it with her or with yourself. Your mind is so consumed with the flesh, the impulse is so strong. You compromise the first thing of God's standard and you feed your flesh. And when you're done... In comes the rationalization. Everyone's doing it. Culture's doing it. Culture says this is okay. It's no big deal. We're going to get married anyway. It's the last time. In your mind, you don't have to raise your hand. Who here is falling to lust in their flesh and in their mindset, this is the last time? I see a lot of people shaking their heads. Just this once, man, I've been good for so long. We rationalize, we rationalize, rather, lather, rinse, repeat, because then it starts all over again. And God says, who are you kidding? Here's what the Holy Spirit says through Timothy, 
Uh, Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.22, turn your back on your lustful thoughts and give your positive attention to goodness, integrity, love, and peace. Turning your back says, you know what? You have a choice in this. You can manage your mind, and you don't have to give it to, into temptation. So how do you break temptation? It's not just about resisting. No, 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 no. We got to replace and refocus. I told this story a few weeks ago um, at church. I preached. Uh, has anyone here ever played the game Bean Boozled? If you don't know what Bean Boozled is, it's this game. It's jelly beans. And first of all, I hate jelly beans. But uh, second of all, I really hate these jelly beans because they have two jelly beans. One looks like a peach-flavored jelly bean, and the other is a barf-flavored jelly bean. Who here is going to volunteer for the barf-flavored jelly bean? No one? You know why? Because it's barf-flavored. And the Bible says that when you return to your sin, it's like a dog returning to its vomit. Do you know the for, I, if I ate that, I would probably vomit, the bar-flavored one. But do you know what I'm not going to eat right after that? Another jelly bean flavored like barf or the barf that's on the table. But yet we do that. We return. We are like dogs that return to our vomit because we keep resisting, we keep resisting, and we don't replace that with something good, something of God, and we don't refocus our attention on Jesus. Instead, what we're too busy doing is we're rationalizing and justifying why it was okay that we do this, and then we're like the dog that returns to the vomit, and a week later, we're like, I did it again. Well, stop eating your vomit. Knock it off. That's gross. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. So we replace it, and we refocus it with the things of Jesus. The key to breaking any temptation is to focus on Jesus, to run away from it. So I must make a commitment to God's standard. I must manage my mind. And three, I must monitor what I consume. We got media at our fingertips all the time. We got a lot of good things. My kids, when the first, I tell you, the first time um, we did Netflix for years and years and years, and then we got YouTube TV. And YouTube TV has commercials because it's TV. I remember when we did that, my son looked at me, hey, Dad, what's that? Where's the show? There's a commercial on, right? He didn't know what it was. We have so many options for TV. The fact that we put ourselves around the, the prostitute over and over and over and over again is crazy to me. We're returning to the vomit. We have so much good stuff. And guess what? If you want to get on it, you can get on VidAngels and you could watch some of that stuff still. It's crazy. Proverbs 15, 14. The fool feeds on trash. Don't be a billy goat. Billy goats eat trash. Talk a lot of food stuff here. Psalm 119, 37. Keep me from paying attention to what is worthless. And Psalm 101, 3. I will refuse to look at anything vile and vulgar. Doesn't that look like managing your mind? Doesn't that last one look like making God's standard your standard? I refuse to look and pay attention to things that are worthless, and I refuse to look at anything vulgar and vile. So I must make a commitment to God's standard. I must manage my mind. I must manage or monitor my media intake, and then I must minimize the opportunity. That means don't place yourself on the street corner next to where you know the prostitute's going to come out. For me, do you know where I don't go on Friday nights alone? I don't go to the bar. Because just because I'm good there one time doesn't mean I'm going to be good there a second time or a third time. Because eventually Satan's going to poke it and turn it. And my flesh is going to be weak because it is weak. And I'm going to have a fight with my wife. Something. Because we're, I'm a jerk. And I feel like I'm always fighting with my wife because I'm a jerk. And I'm going to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, and I'm going to fall to my flesh. We do that with our phones. You know what? Uh, I'm going to get to that in a minute. <laughs> so I minimize the opportunity. If you don't want to get stung, do you go by the bee's nest? It's a mistake in my girl, right? Oh, I hit some nerves on that one, didn't I? <laughs> if you don't want to get burned, do we play with fire? Like I said... 
I have a problem with al alcohol. I don't go to the bar to eat the pretzels. I find another place to eat pretzels. <laughs> your phones, your apps, the blockers. There's three ways we can minimize what tempts taste. First, you gotta recognize what tempts you. What's your trigger? What's that thing? What's that thing that the flesh and culture tells you is okay? Recognize the situations that turn you on, that stimulate you, that get you thinking about other things other than Jesus. What's that thing pulling at your heart, pulling at your desires, pulling at your flesh? 1 Corinthians 10, 12, be careful if you're thinking, oh, I'd never be like that. Let this be a warning to you, for you may fall into sin. Be alert, be wise. No one is above temptation. No one is above falling. There are people that I've been in ministry with that I was like, that person would never, ever, ever leave. And I've watched as our kids have cried as I've left. And not only do they leave, they try to rip the church down as they do it. Because sin destroys, the flesh destroys. Number two, I choose your companions carefully. Choose your companions carefully. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad companions ruin good character. I can see it when people are about to give into their flesh because who they surround themselves with. Is it the people who are strong in the faith and are going to challenge them and are going to call them out and hold them to God's standard? They're going to ask them to manage their mind and do all those things to make that commitment? Or is it the people that are like, yeah, 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 you can do this. Yeah, this is cool. Yeah, this is fun. The flesh is awesome. I can see it because of who you surround yourself with. It's way easier if we're doing the chair, this, the chair thing. If I'm standing on a chair, it's a whole lot easier for uh, Britain to pull me down than me to pull her up. And that's how we do with our friends. That means you need to choose your friends wisely and put people in your life that are going to call you out. They're going to say, you know what, culture and the world isn't right. God's standard is right, and I'm going to help you hold you to that until you tell me to go away. And number three, I established some protective guidelines. In Ephesians 5.3, but among you, there, may, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. That means you put guidelines and things in your life to say, I'm not going to do this. I've got a couple guys in my ministry, and I'm super proud of them for this. They don't put their phones in their rooms at night. They charge their phones out in the living room. But my alarm clock is on my phone. If anyone has that excuse, there are alarm clocks on Amazon for $8. I will buy you an alarm clock if that's your excuse for you keeping your phone in your room. That's bogus. Because you know what you do? You get on your dang phones. You get on Facebook. There's a little ad on the side. And then you give into your flesh over and over and over again. One of the coolest things I've ever seen a guy do in regards to this, Boston Johnson had a dumb phone for years. I can call and I can text. That's all I need my phone for. Because he couldn't, he'd find a way around his, his apps and his things like that, the guards, the things like that. Because he couldn't do it, he got himself a dumb phone and he got his feet on the ground and his heart right with Jesus and now he has a smartphone again because he put some guidelines in his life. He was willing to cut off his hand and say, you know what, my desires are killing me. My desires are taking me out. My desires are making me ineffective. My desires are not letting me lead my girlfriend right. My desires are not letting me lead in the church. My desires are doing all this stuff, and they are pulling me away from Jesus. I need something in my life to keep my feet on the ground long enough so my heart can get right. And you have to have guidelines in your life and in your walk with Jesus you have to know what triggers your desires, what triggers your flesh. You have to put people in your life that are God-centered to hold you to those standards and help you and love you through it because when you're breaking the flesh, it takes a whole lot of love and a whole lot of patience because those things get so deep-rooted. And you have to have guidelines and God's standard in your life for the way that you should live. There is no verse that says, thou shalt put phone on charger and kitchen but those guys are looking at their lives and looking at the things in their lives and saying, you know what? My way wasn't working. I need to do this differently. So I must make a commitment to God's standard. I must manage my mind. I must manage or monitor my media intake. I minimize the opportunity. And last is I must magnify the consequences of sin. I must magnify the consequences of sin. You and I need to magnify the consequences of sin sex outside of marriage, giving in to the flesh that God has set up. I've been a small group leader and ministry leader for like the last 14 years or so. And I've heard stories of heartache and of sin. 
stories of girls that were taken advantage of. I've seen broken hearts and rejection. And I've seen dam the damage it does to hearts and souls and minds. And Satan is crafty. And like I said before, he sets up things far in advance. He uses the things and the pleasures and desires of the flesh to take us down. And he knows what I know now, that nothing damages your emotions more than sexual sin. I wish I could contact some of the girls that I tr mistreated back in the day. I don't know some of them. And apologize because I was less, way less than what God wanted me to be. I didn't know the consequences back then. I thought it was just a good night and a good time. It damages things. And our sexuality, it invades almost every single part of our life. It's just not a physical act, it's emotional, it's spiritual. And the desires of our flesh are like that. And I wish I could take it away. I wish I had waited. I wish I hadn't hurt girls like I did. In Proverbs 6.26, immorality may cost you your life. I didn't know that at the time, but I do now. And in 1 Timothy 4.16, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. It's this perse persevere in them. And I want to emphasize that to you all right now. When we don't, like, know the consequence and know, like, because what we do is we get in church and we, we feel good about ourselves. I went to church on Sunday. I went to small group. I went to God time and discipleship time. I went to cross chat. I did all this stuff. But we're not taking our sin and our desires seriously. And it's kind of like someone who's ambidextrous, playing with both hands, right? God says, no, you can't do that. You can't play both sides of this. You gotta be in or you gotta be out. And I can tell you this, if you're not ready to make God's standard, your standard, you're wasting your time here. You're wasting your time at this conference. You're wasting the time of the people around you because there are people that are trying to do this and, and we think it's just going to church and playing church and there's no consequence for our action. We think that when we get to the end of this life, we die or whatever happens, that we're just gonna get the free pass, pass into heaven and it's just not like that. So when it comes to canceling culture, I must make the commitment to God's standard because that's the standard that we should live by. I must manage my mind, monitor my media intake, minimize the opportunity and magnify the consequences of sin. Because cancel culture in the world and culture says you can live however you want. You can go to church, you can punch the time clock and you can be okay. But God says that if you're not fully obeying me, if you're not living to glorify me, if you're bowing to your flesh and bowing to culture, that you're not... Lord, we prophesied in your name, and we did all this stuff, and we drove out demons, and Jesus to say, get away from me, I never knew you. I don't want to live my life like that. I don't want to live my life in my flesh, in my desires, because all I've ever seen that bring in my home was destruction, in my family is destruction, and we have to take these things seriously. We cannot live by the desires of our flesh and please Jesus. When we live by the desires of the flesh, we're bowing to culture and we have to stop doing that. We're coming out of COVID. We're coming out of the excuses. It's time to get back on it and, and surrender to Jesus and live for him because the world needs it. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but when I go to live events, it's different than it was before COVID. The devil wanted to use COVID for a bad thing. I think it stirred the hearts of men and they're ready for a relationship with Jesus. And they need people who are willing to stand up, to be courageous, stand against culture, and live and be Jesus for people here on earth. Jesus didn't give into the flesh when he was tempted by Satan. He stood up and he built the church and he started the church and we are benefactors of that. We have some amazing people here. I, I, don't, I've, I know we've been shouting out the Wisconsin people. I love you all. I'm excited you're here. I can't wait to hear all your stories. If you want to hear more of my story, I have my open book. 
uh, let's sit down and talk because I'm excited that we have brothers and sisters here that are, that are trying to do the same things and live for Jesus and stand up against culture because it can't just be uh, a couple churches in Wisconsin and a couple in St. Louis and one down in Tulsa, one up in New York, right? Oh, so, my bad, South Carolina. Whatever, you know, right here. For, for... Okay, South Carolina. Hey, New York. We, we, yeah, you're from New York, right? Okay. Um, there's, I'm sure there's a church there trying to do it, but we all have to be together, right, and do this to stand against culture. Because the more people that are united in Jesus Christ and standing against the flesh and standing against the pride of life and, and the lust of the eyes, the better off we're going to be of making a difference and canceling the culture here in this world. Let's live and be like Jesus for people. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, Lord, I want to thank you for what you do in our lives. God, you've given me a second chance. You canceled my debts instead of canceling me. And I know I deserve to die for the things I did, but you gave me an opportunity at a new life. And I know, Lord, you've done that for so many other people here. And I pray that we can take that gift that we can never forget it and live our life in gratitude in service to the king who gave us the opportunity. Help us to remember that culture is just culture, but you've already overcome the world or culture, God, when you sent Jesus Christ to live and to die for us. Help us to always remember that. Help us to live by the Spirit in everything that we do. Help us to glorify you. And God, honestly, help us just to build relationships here that help us to stand firm in this world, God. Help us to live by your standard, to, to manage our minds, to monitor the things that come in. Help us to stay away from those things, God, but also to empower us to live within them, God, because those things aren't going away. And God, help us to remember that there's something at stake. It's our eternity and the eternity of the people around us. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.